Welcome to Conversations with KMK Rider. And every week I talk with Vermonters who are leaders in the fields of government, education, the arts, and community life. My guests are Kate Webb, who's a representative to the Vermont House in District 5-2, and Jessica Kamai of Brumstead. I knew Jessica <laughs> Kamai many, many years ago, so I'll stick it in there, don't I? <laughs> Jessica Kamai Brumstead, who is the uh, representative to the Vermont House from District 5 1, correct? Five Switch. Two. Switch. Five Switch into. Okay. <laughs> Jessica is 5 2, Kate is 5 1. Okay. And welcome to our uh, listeners on radio station WBTV LP 99.3 FM. It's a pleasure to have you here. I've had Kate before. And uh, welcome, to our, welcome to the show. Uh, how long have you served in the Vermont House and uh, why are you running for re election? Uh, I have served five terms in the House. I came in with Obama in that uh, campaign. That's when we were just starting to really feel the effects of the recession. I'm running again. This will be my sixth, my sixth term. Good. Should I win? I am unopposed, so I'm, I don't want to be overconfident, but <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm feeling pretty good that I'll probably be back. Okay, great. And Jessica? I'm, um, th I've been in Montpelier just one session, so that I'm running for my second, and I'm unopposed as well. However, I'm um, still going door to door and trying to find out. It, it's been an interesting um, process to be able to go door to door this time and say to folks, hi, I'm Jessica, and I'm your representative. And so people come out and want to have a conversation with what, what they think is going well and what isn't going right. well. And so it's a different, it, it makes you feel more like you belong on the doorstep. And whereas two years ago, I felt very um, unsure of all of my answers. And now I feel a little bit like people want me to do this. Great, so. yeah. Different, different time, diff different era for you, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, you both are unopposed. Now, I interview uh, Representative Ann Pugh from uh, South Burlington, and she also is unopposed, and, but she said this was good for her and perhaps bad for democracy. How do you feel about that? It's an interesting way of looking at it. Um, you know, why are people not running a, a campaign against us? Um, are there people that just aren't interested? I always say I'm running unopposed because either people like what I'm doing they don't think they can beat me or nobody wants my job. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. Um, so I speak regularly with the uh, people that don't agree with me in my district, so I have that opportunity. The advantage to me this year in not having a campaign is that I have an opportunity to work on more policy work, uh, particularly in the area of education, which is undergoing quite a bit of change. We have a new secretary, changes there. So it's allowed me to be uh, spend time being up to date in that area. So that's been a, been a gift. I still um, answer my emails. I still meet with people. I'm still you know, following legislation that people would like me to introduce. And I, I would agree as well. I. Um, I think I agree with everything that um, Kate said. I think that a democracy, a citizen's legislature inside of a democracy is interesting. It's hard to run for office. And it's even harder to be a member. And it's not just because the pay isn't great. It's, um, I mean, you really do. To me, I spend 100% of my time working as a legislator, and a lot of legislators are also have full-time jobs. And so it's a big decision. You're away from your family a bit. I mean, the weather um, in Montpelier seems to be uh, snowing all the time. <laughs> and from, from someone who's not a great snow driver, I worry about getting home and all of those things. So it's a, it's a tough one, and we, we may need I mean, that's something we look at and talk about at the state house is how, do, how, how can we assure that, that we are open to all citizens being able to run for office? And that also brings me to civics, which is something that I worked really hard on last year to get passed, that we have more opportunities for civic education in our communities and in our schools. And uh, it was an eye-opening experience, actually, because what I heard mostly was local control 
in the schools, and so therefore don't tell us what we want, what our curriculum needs to be. But yet, when I, I have four children, and when I look at the differences in what they learned about civics and their responsibilities under our democracy, as well as the wonderful things that come with it, um, they learned less and less. Mm. By the time we got to my baby, who is now 18, he really didn't know much at all about our immigration policies, for example. So when we had so much conversation about immigration a year ago, um, he, he had a lot of questions. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I, I, uh, I applaud the idea that you're going out and talking to people. Uh, because, uh, um, as you pointed out, uh, people will talk to you people will ask you questions. And this is very, very important. And if you don't go up to the doorsteps, you never really know what the, what's going on in the different neighborhoods. And there are distinct neighborhoods. And I think that's very, very important to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I applaud that idea. And I also have to add to this that I don't think people learn history anymore. I, uh, you know, so yeah, let's go on, shall we? <laughs> and Kay, you're one of my one of the neighbors I go to visit. Oh yes, why well, you my... I gave you a big greeting. Yes, you did. <laughs> you so, you, you did. felt very. Joan Lennis, I think, was a little surprised. Yeah. <laughs> when, when, well, Kay, when they when they came to our door, yeah. Yeah. Jessica. Yeah, because yeah, you know. we so, knew anyway. each other. <laughs> <laughs> so that was fun for her and for me. Uh, um, the Vermont House. Uh, voted to uh, legalize small amounts of marijuana. Uh, did you oppose uh, or support the bill, and why? I supported the bill. I think that the bill that we passed uh, was a balanced and realistic approach to reform. I think what we needed to keep track of, I also think of it as a first step. I think we need to keep track of um, to whom we are opening up this freedom and then whom do we need to protect? And I think the, the bill started that conversation. I don't think we're done, but I think we did address those. Uh, uh, marijuana, alcohol, tobacco in the hands of the developing brain, science says that's not good. Um, what we do in public, public behavior and safety, that is also an issue when we address those. So um, I think there's more that can be done in terms of safety. Um, and I'm looking forward to that continuing conversation. Jessica, you, you did not support the bill, is that correct? That's correct. I voted against um, legalizing marijuana at, this, at that time. I um, wrestled with the decision. I'm, as I said earlier, I'm a mother of four children, all being faced with the issues around uh, marijuana. Now, of course, they're all underage, so under not any longer, but at the time that I started thinking about legalization of marijuana, I also wrestled with the argument that I heard from some of my constituents around, you know, when I come home at the end of the day, I want to, be, if I don't want to have a glass of wine, but instead have a little bit of marijuana, I want to feel that in my kitchen, I can make that choice. And I understand that, that difficult I think that that is hard, and a libertarian would say, you know, they should be able to do that. However, I feel that we have significant public health issues and safety concerns and enforcement issues that we just have not worked out in this legislation and, or in this now, this law, and that greatly concerns me. And I honestly, in going door to door, I heard from so many more of my constituents that were concerned that we just weren't ready. Um, and I understand also that a lot of our other states around us are doing it and to me and so then there's that question of okay if they're doing it anyway but I, I still feel that you've got to give it its due diligence and mm -hmm. we have a lot more work to do and so this year we uh, there's a lot of conversation about tax and regulate I'd like to see that we would um, spend time looking at that and looking at the way that we regulate alcohol. Um, and I'm not talking about wine and beer, but true, you know, the um, heavier alcohol. And uh, think about how we might um, regulate and tax this because it's an odd situation right now that you can grow marijuana, but you can't buy it um, <laughs> and or sell it, thank God. But how do we, uh, how do you buy it? You know, it's an inter it's an interesting thought. So, uh, that was my good friend Helen Reilly, who was a representative mm -hmm. in Montpelier for many years, said the bill needs tweaking. 
Yes. And that's yes. what that's what Helen always used to say. Every year, that's what we're doing. Every year, we're tweaking bills that we passed in the past. That's just part of government and and dealing with changes over time. Right now, there are eighty to hundred thousand people that admit to using marijuana, and I certainly know plenty of people who are you know important members of our community that enjoy a little marijuana. Sure. We know that, um, but just because there are problems, yeah. does that mean that we should do prohibition on alcohol? Well, that didn't work. Yeah. Should oh, we mean Lord, that, no. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I just don't think the prohibition model um, is a model that's going to work here. Um, there's a long history uh, in, in terms of marijuana, uh, why it was moved to a, a Schedule One drug in the first place, which is just an inappropriate place for something as benign as marijuana. Yeah. Marijuana is not heroin. Well, you know, uh, I think that uh, one one of the big issues, of course, is is kids getting a hold of it. This is this is where you know, particularly high school, and you know, they they are their bodies and their brains are not right. per, are not matured at that point. And I think that that as the legislators and as members of society, we have a responsibility here. Right, and I Agreed. and I agree that it. I was very supportive. I wasn't a legislator at the time when we decriminalized um, marijuana so that um, you w it was more of a misdemeanor rather than a felony to be caught with marijuana. It's just that I think it, we need to do a lot more work to be sure. Here we are talking about how terrible cigarettes are for folks' health, and yet we're, we're going to legalize another um, substance that could really hurt people's lungs yeah. and so there's just there's a lot more conversation. Okay now this leads us to vaping which of course is <laughs> the latest thing it came into uh, it came into uh, what was born because it was a good idea oh we can get people off real cigarettes with more nicotine have them vape and maybe they'll give up smoking and now we have the young folks uh, thriving on this. And the EPA is saying, oh, we have to control this. Anything to say about this, Jessica? Well, I, again, I go back to my children um, and my family. My brother, who um, really struggled with giving up cigarettes, he used the patch, he went to um, hypnotists to help him. Nothing helped. And so he um, ended up using an e-cigarette, which is vaping, and redu it reduces the nicotine, the amount of nicotine that you put in on a regular basis over time, and it worked for the first time in 30 years of trying to give up smoking. Of course, he lives in Rhode Island, and he came to Vermont to work on my bedroom that needed a bunch of renovation, and that's when he decided he was going to give up smoking for real this time by the e-cigarettes, which was not the greatest uh, thing for our relationship. However, <laughs> probably related to your house rules on smoking. Right? Yes, <laughs> that's right, exactly. But he, so he really, it worked for him, but now what's happening is something that the kids call juuling versus vaping, and it's exactly the same thing except that juuling is the brand, and it has flavors and all kinds of things that makes it more, it, it, is, it attracts the young people. And this is a real problem, and we need to think about how to go about that. Now, of course, you can buy those jewels when you are 18. And I believe that, and that's because that's what our marijuana, I mean, our um, uh, tobacco rules are, that you can buy uh, cigarettes when you're 18, but that most of our laws are at 21. And so it would be nice if we could raise that the um, uh, cigarette age to 21. And we've worked hard on that in Montpelier. Um, unfortunately, it continues to Can't fail. Can't get it through. <laughs> yeah, it, in the House yeah. it fails in the um, in committee. And I did um, co-sponsor um, some legislation to do that last session or the last two years. And in the Senate, it made it out of committee, but failed by a vote of 16 to, or 13 to 16. Well, it's so. very it's very hard. Uh, all these things, they they as I understand it. They have done so much advertising and appealing, and you know, 
the juicy fruit taste, mm -hmm. you know, all these nice tastes, you know. The, the, the young folks are attracted to this. Well, the health and future of that kind of business is dependent upon hooking people in their teenage years. Mm -hmm. And by, um, by the flavoring that they're adding is clearly appealing to a certain age group. And um, it's very distressing to see that, that, that happening. So while we can appreciate that it has helped some smokers uh, stop smoking, the fact that it also is increasing uh, a w application to younger population is disturbing and distressing. So we may need some Vermont laws about the vaping and the age that uh, you can start. Buying it in the stores. Yeah. I think we've at least declared it a tobacco, tobacco product. Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. we have. No, that's yeah. a start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right. that's definitely a start. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of things to talk about, yeah. and everything is, uh, as Diane Snelling used to say, very complicated. And I'm talking with uh, Jessica Brumstead and Kate Webb, representatives of the House State Legislature. Um, face, the state is facing an opioid crisis. It's really quite, quite bad. Uh, the House has, and the, uh, the state of Vermont, the legislature, has passed some laws about this. Uh, would you care to comment on what laws have been passed? Well, I think um, our hub and spoke model has been very helpful. I think one of the things that we need to keep our eye on right now is the AG's uh, lawsuit against um, Purdue Pharma. Um, if you look at his lawsuit, they identify that in 1996, um, opioids, opioids were used only uh, in end-of-life issues, in cancer, um, and by 2012, it was the most prescribed uh, drug on the market. And if you've read, I'm, I'm halfway through um, a, a, a book, and I'm forget, uh, forgetting the name of the book, um, Dreamland. Um, where they're actually looking at the tying together you know, the uh, uh, economic you know, problems in Mexico with uh, big pharma and bringing uh, heroin in. So we have um, a, a very large problem. I think what is of interest right now is what are, we, what are we up to right now? What are some of the things that are going on in the State House right now? I think we did pass, um, we did pass uh, we did allow for an increased number of beds at the Brattleboro Retreat, so that's looking at that end. One of the things that I worked on um, was adverse childhood experiences, children growing up with toxic stress. If you talk with people in the schools, they will tell you that what they're seeing in the schools now, I retired in 2013 and they're saying even since then, the number of children that are coming in, living um, with toxic stress in their homes, much of it, uh, much of it due to opioid use. Yep. Um, and they're just not being parented, and, and the long-term impact on brains is significant. So in terms of the work that, that is currently going on, um, we are looking at um, actually creating a, a position. We actually created a position, a director of trauma and prevention and, and resilience, and that person will be uh, looking at protective factors, coordinating services across the agencies because it affects judiciary, it affects human services, it affects health care, it affects education. In addition, we're looking at um, increasing or updating the relationship between the uh, mental health agencies and the schools. Mm -hmm. So I didn't totally answer where you were, but I did take us to the mm -hmm. areas that, that right. I've been working right. on. I hope that's right. okay. That's, that's fine. Yeah. That's so, fine. Um, um, one thing that, that I yeah. have noticed in this area yeah. uh, that I have uh, really supported is that uh, there is a law now that if someone, someone has OD'd and another person is with them, right. that person mm -hmm. can stay there. Exactly. And they aren't going to be persecuted. You know, They're not prosecuted. at risk. They're, 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 there's right. no problem with that. And I think that's very, very positive because you should not leave somebody in an OD right. si situation alone, I don't think. And the other thing that I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a communications person, a media person, and I hear, I've noticed uh, in the obituaries, families mm -hmm. will now put in there that the, that the young person in the family has it's over, died from an overdose of drugs. Uh, this, I think, is a very positive move because you see these young people, you see the faces, they're vibrant, they're young, and they're gone. And mm -hmm. the family has said why they're gone. And I think we have to get all this stuff, if you will, out in the open, out in the air, 
it's like cancer years ago, breast cancer, things like that. Ooh, 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 you know. And now pe people are talking about it more, and I think that's I think that's positive. I agree. I agree. I was just thinking about also our primary care physicians throughout Vermont. At first, many of them didn't want to treat addicted opiate. Um, folks who, who needed the treatments in order to continue to stay um, off of the drugs. But now we've really slowly gotten rid of that stigma. So um, folks are coming into primary care offices across the state, which has really been wonderful because instead of having a long waiting list for people who have um, who are addicted and want to get off but don't know how to do it without another, um, and I'm trying to think of the drug that we give for Narcan? The, no, no. Narcan? Um, it's, I can't it's, think of uh, uh, yeah. yeah. what you mean. Suboxone. Yeah, Suboxone and give things it, like that. Right. Yes, yeah. that you yeah. have to, yeah. but it has to be um, given as a prescription and it needs to be monitored and there needs to be good mental health counseling and all of those things. We didn't have very many folks doing it and now through a lot of work we've switched that around and really the other type of legislation is that um, physicians cannot um, give as many pain pills once if you have knee surgery for example you can't give them a whole bottle and I have a perfect example of that in our own house my youngest who when he was in fourth grade had um, broken his wrist and they gave him a whole a whole thing that they gave to me for him to take of oxycodone oh my god and because they had it it needed yeah. surgery and all sure, those sort of yeah. things so it was a big deal but he ended up using advil Mm -hmm. But then my next <laughs> son, who um, broke his arm playing soccer in college and um, needed a plate and 13 screws, when he went in, they only gave him five pills, mm -hmm. which was great because honestly, he got really sick from them anyway yep. and um, wouldn't have wanted, he didn't want to take them. And the other nice part about that actually was that my older son was very nervous about taking any pain pills because we have done such a good job, I think, of educating folks yep. now in the schools about the dangers around taking some of these pain meds. Yep. So. Um, a lot of things are slowly changing. Unfortunately, we, this is a big problem, and yep. it's not easy. Right. To I have a son who's an orthopedic surgeon, mm -hmm. and so you know they they're on the forefront of all this. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, part of this again, I come back to it, communication. He's he's at Kaiser Permanente and in, mm -hmm. in one, one of the Kaiser Permanente hospitals in in uh, California, and they they tell people right up front you know, what to expect. You're gonna have some discomfort. If you have a knee operation or have a hip replacement, you know, you are gonna have some discomfort. But, you know, let's let's get on with this. You know, do your exercise, get up, get out of bed, you know, all that stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Easier said than done for some people because pe people have different thresholds. But it's very important to, to uh, have this, in, in again, in the forefront. Well, and if, and if you look back, in the 90s, how this, I mean, the whole thing started really because of exactly what the Attorney General is doing. It's definitely the pharmacy, I mean, the, the companies, but also the regulators of our hospitals would had what those everyone saw those little faces they used yep. to bring into your room and yep. say where's your pain right. and you if too many people had put that their pain was at the end oh, yeah. then you would get hit hard no, right. by the regulators the world, the world has changed exactly and i think and i think it's better now we don't have much time left here uh, let's go on to a little small problem uh, <laughs> uh gun control uh, the uh, the state of Vermont didn't have much gun control legisl legislation at all. And after the Parkland, Florida murders in the school, and after there was an alleged plot, mm -hmm. some young man to uh, shoot up the Fairhaven Union School students, the governor of the state of Vermont, Governor Scott, who's an NRA member, said, uh oh, we need to do something. And very quickly, Vermont, for the first time, passed gun control legislation. Do you support this? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, in terms of um, a couple of years ago, we worked on legislation to simply say, if a court says that you have a mental health issue that makes you it too dangerous for you to have a gun, 
you can't buy a gun. We had, I can't tell you how we had to fight for that. Yeah. Um, all of a sudden, all of the, the, the NRA folks were fighting for people with mental health issues. Of course, none of them would <laughs> vote for increased support for mental health, but they wanted to make sure that people who had mental health issues were not being discriminated against. Yeah. We were able to get that through finally, um, but it brings us to now where we were <laughs> almost, as, I suppose, saying we are armed and ready for it isn't exactly <laughs> the right thing to say. <laughs> but we were really ready, and I think our um, the the judiciary committees in the House and Senate were were amazing. Mm -hmm. You know what what we've done is um, uh, we've banned bump stocks, we have limited magazine capacity, um, we've set age limits to 21, and we've put in place extreme risk protection orders um, and addressed uh, domestic violence issues where you know that someone would be arrested and then they go back and shoot up their partners so and I yeah. am in, in total agreement I um, support gun control legislation I uh, actually spoke in the Judiciary Committee testified as a mom um, I I think that it's also important that we assure safety in our schools and that we put funding towards that and we did do that in this last budget so that we have more resource counselors and more drug counselors in the schools so we can um, be better at all of those things. I, um, I was a, a officer on our PTO when the very first for me when what Columbine in Colorado happened mm -hmm. and I, we worked very hard a group of us moms who yep. said the school should be locked and yep. it was Charlotte school and we we got it locked yep. and then we took turns being out front explaining to people who were angry that the door was locked why it was locked right. our kids were in there and they needed to be safe right the kids need to be safe and this brings us of course to the school budget <laughs> and in the, for the state of Vermont, the biggest expenditure is in education. And we do have a problem wrestling with state, how much state oversight we will have of the schools and the local control of the school, schools. And I send you back to the legislature to work on those <laughs> issues. And I, I do, like a lot of other people, I expect that some compromise will be, will be found. And I thank you for coming on the, the show. And I wish you good luck as you go out talking to your constituents. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Conversations with Kay. Thank you. Here we go. It's okay.